Hi everyone, welcome back to Cody's Lab. So today we're going to determine whether or not having a recoil on a gun actually decreases the power that is put into the bullet or not. Now I've done this before using a smaller bullet like this golf ball and measuring the velocities with my chronograph and I believe the result of that was that the speed was roughly the same. Many people were still unconvinced and so instead of the golf ball I'm going to be shooting this two kilogram brass slug. This brass slug actually weighs almost exactly the same amount as the gun. So the recoil ought to be quite significant. For the first test, I've got it braced up against the side of the mountain here. There's a steel plate. And you can see the cannon sitting here tied up against it. This is our no recoil position. And then we're just going to measure the uh, velocity of this using a high speed camera. I would use the chronograph, but unfortunately I actually destroyed the thing. Not for any reasons that you would expect. It was actually the stupidest way possible. I left it in the back of a car and the, the heat must have destroyed the electronics somehow. So I'll get another one of those, but I think uh, the high speed camera ought to be able to match these up just fine. So obviously I'm going to be using the same amount of black powder and the same amount of wadding for each shot. I think, I think I'm just going to do three of these worth, so a fairly light load. That way it just kind of pops the thing out rather than really sending it because uh, I'm kind of worried about the gun actually exploding in this situation because there's going to be a lot of pressure built up here. I have shot heavier things out of this than before though, so I'm fairly certain it'll be okay. Though I don't think either of us are going to be around to watch this with our own eyeballs because uh, the amount, you know, if the gun blows up we'd rather not have shrapnel hit us. So. That's the powder. Now time for the wad, which I'm just going to use this piece of cloth here, fold it in half, and then wad it down in there. <laughs> that could have been dangerous. All right, let's just put that against there, light it, and run away. Okay, so the cannon remained in the same spot. Looks like it forced that back nice and tight against the wall. Excellent, there's a little bit of a dent in the wood, but everything's a-okay. Now I gotta go find that brass slug. Let's see. Well, there it is. Oh. Yeah, we're roughly an eighth of a mile from where we fired this. And as you can see, it's worse for wear, but it's mostly intact. It hasn't bent it or anything, it's just got some pop marks where it hit rocks. Okay, so let's uh, test this again. This is so that uh, brass projectile doesn't fly so far. Okay, there's our target there. That should slow down the brass projectile at least. And as you can see, I've brought this away from the mountainside a little bit. That way, the cannon is free to recoil. So, let's light it and see what happens. I think we caught it. Let's get that camera. Okay. All right, so the brass rod is sitting right there in the road. Perfect. Should have done that from the beginning. There's a nice hole with a wad sticking out of it. Yes. And the cannon has flown back into the hillside and uh, punched its way into the clay quite a bit. Cool. Let's go check that high speed. To better see the results, I'm going to overlay the videos on top of each other so you can see them side by side. Now 
Now if we look at this frame by frame, you can see that the two projectiles have almost exactly the same velocity. So there you have it. My hypothesis was correct. The gun that was strapped down shot with the same velocity as the gun that was allowed to move back. But why was I correct? My reasoning was that Newton's third law, that every action would produce an equal and opposite reaction, doesn't matter what happens to the gun, the same amount of energy is going to go into the bullet as goes into the gun. My friend Ben from the YouTube channel Nighthawk and Light had a slightly different hypothesis as to what would happen. You see, the amount of velocity that the bullet would achieve depends on the amount of work done to it. The more work you do to it, the more velocity it should attain. And work is force times distance. So if you put a force behind the bullet and then push it a distance, you get work. The greater the distance, the more work. So if you assume that the pressure inside the barrels are about the same, and one of them has the barrel move away, it's going to have an effective distance of being pushed on it less than the barrel that is remaining stationary and not being pulled away. This hypothesis makes a lot of sense, and I'm actually fairly surprised that that's not what happened. This does appear to violate Newton's third law, however, because there's a force on the gun, but the gun does not move, therefore no work is being done on it. And in order to put work into the bullet, you have to do work on the gun. For the gun that's moving, this is not a problem because you can see that force is being applied and it's going over a distance, so the same amount of work is being done on the gun as being done on the bullet. In order to explain this, we have to go back and look at Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. This isn't just a quirk of mathematics or a good idea, it's the law. If you put a force on something, it has to move. Unless, of course, it has infinite mass, which nothing in our universe actually has. So the gun's motion is not zero. In fact, if you assume that the gun's mass is now effectively the mass of the Earth, and you put a force on it, now it does move a tiny fraction of the width of an atom, but it does move. And actually, because the Earth is not rigid, it does move quite a bit more than that. In fact, you can see the camera shakes during the shot because the movement of the Earth forms a shock wave that goes through and shakes the camera. And in the second shot where you have the gun moving back and then slamming against the clay, you can actually see two shakes, one coming from the sound wave and the other coming from the shock wave from the ground when the gun hits it, which is really cool and definitely shows that the gun is moving a small amount. But still, the gun is moving much less than the bullet. So how is it that they both have the same amount of work? The only way I could figure to explain this was that there must be more pressure on the back of the gun, you know, more force being done on the gun than on the bullet. This would be pretty easy to test because the gun has a little touch hole that the gases can escape. If we go look at the video and see that more gas is escaping on the gun that is stationary than the gun that is moving, then we can see that there is more pressure being put on the gun. And when we go back and look at the video, that is exactly the case. So how is it that inside of a gun where you've got a contained amount of hot expanding gas, that you could have more pressure going in one direction than the other? The answer lies in the fact that the gas cannot travel from one end to the gun to the other instantaneously. In fact, if we take a slinky, and the compressed version of the slinky is your gunpowder, and then when we ignite the gunpowder, you can let the slinky expand. If we hold one spot stationary and pull on the other, you can see that the slinky expands more in the one direction, and it takes a long time for that expansion to move all the way through it. If we expand the slinky from both directions, you can see that the center of the slinky remains compressed until some time after I started pulling on it. This means that the pressure at the center of an explosion is always going to be higher than the pressure at the edges. So this means the pressure on the bullet or the chamber of the gun is a function of how far away from the center of the explosion it is. For the gun that's stationary, the back of the gun and the center of the explosion remain fairly close together, and so the pressure remains high. So the force on the gun is incredibly large for the entire time that the gun is being pushed back. So it's a short distance, but a large pressure. Now, the bullet that is being moved forwards, the pressure on the bullet is decreasing as it moves away from the center of the explosion. So you have a smaller force over a larger distance, and it happens to work out that the amount of work done is equal but opposite, therefore not violating Newton's third law. So even given this new information, I'm still left with a little bit of a problem. 
You see, the gun that's allowed to move effectively has a barrel that has half the length of the barrel of the gun, which is not allowed to move. Even though the pressure decreases rapidly with distance from the center of the explosion, the bullet of the braced gun has longer to accelerate. So how could it be that the same amount of work has been done to the bullet in either case? In fact, you can see on the unbraced gun that some energy is being lost because the center of the explosion winds up outside of the barrel and then expands rapidly into the atmosphere without doing work on the bullet. I think the answer to this is that the braced gun is losing its energy elsewhere. Remember how more gas was being lost through the touch hole on the braced gun than the unbraced gun? That's right. I think that because the pressure on the back of the gun is greater, it loses more gas through the touch hole than the gun that was not braced. That combined with the fact that most of the acceleration happens in the first little bit of the barrel means that I happen to get the same velocity for either bullet. So I sort of got lucky and had my hypothesis seem to come true. So if you had a gun with no touch hole and a very short barrel, I should expect to see the braced gun actually shoot farther than the non-braced gun. In fact, when I try the experiment again, but instead of a gun, I use a clicky pen. So instead of gunpowder, I have a compressed spring. You can see that when I don't brace it as well, the pen does not travel quite as far. This is because that as the object that the pen is pushing against moves away, the force decreases, and so a lot more of the spring's energy gets wasted as heat or vibrations as the pen moves off. This actually makes a lot of sense because in an internal combustion engine, the more compression I have, the more efficient the engine will be. If the cylinder was infinitely long, it wouldn't matter because even though the force on the piston decreases, it would all add up to the maximum amount of energy possible. But since the piston is of a finite length, it is better to have a higher pressure on it because then more work is done over that period. And therefore, less of the energy gets wasted when you then release the gas back into the exhaust. So it appears that my hypothesis was correct in a real-world situation with my cannon. It doesn't matter whether I let it recoil or not. But it also seems that Nighthawk was also correct in the fact that the gun would be more efficient if it is not allowed to recoil. However, I have to say that most people are wrong in the assumption that because the gun is moving back, the energy of the gun could have been used for the bullet. No, the same amount of energy always has to go into both objects. The total amount of energy released, however, can be smaller. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know I did. I'll see you next time. If you haven't already, I definitely recommend going and checking out Ben's channel. Nighthawk and Light is certainly one of my favorites on YouTube. He does many projects which go along with what I do, and rumor has it he's going to mention me in one of his videos. So there will be a link on the screen and in the description so you guys can go have a look. My fork collapsed. <laughs>